universal CPE. Um, this is an area that's getting a lot of industry attention because uh, um, the, the premise of universal CPE is really about making connectivity to the cloud for the business client a lot more simpler, affordable, and autonomous. Um, the slide we're showing t right now um, is really to level set what we mean by universal CPE uh, in contrast to other term terms. It's, it's an all-embracing term you know, focused on um, whether it's a virtualized service or application or non-virtualized service, uh, services. Um, I did want to flag that SD-WAN has emerged as a, as, a, as a use case that now has been embraced by the global industry, whether these are enterprises, whether these are uh, telcos or comm service providers or CSPs. Um, and the reason why is fundamentally that it leverages the existing infrastructure. This technology, I'm gonna talk about this more as we get deeper, but uh, it can be deployed as an overlay on existing infrastructure. Um, it brings in the elements of SDN control essentially automating the, uh, the, uh, the world of service provisioning and configuration, we'll call it controller management, which is very powerful for the comm service writers. And, uh, and basically, it's scalable. The technology itself has been around for a long time, um, and it's, it's, it's essentially coming to fruition now because of the SDN elements. So what is SD-WAN, um, just to build on that? Um, it's essentially a, a simplified and cost-effective way of connecting to the, the network, um, or, sh or should I say to the cloud across the, the wide area network, the WAN. Um, the traditional infrastructure is predominantly router-based. Uh, MPLS, which you guys will be familiar with, is essentially the, the, the technology that exists in the existing network, or as, as it's often referred as the underlay network. It provides all the routing intelligence, the rerouting capabilities, and the QoS elements um, that businesses have become used to and rely on. Um, SD-WAN essentially, uh, as an implementation, separates the control plane from the data plane. So your, 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 your IP pipes or your Ethernet pipes you know, are, are driven by an overarching uh, control layer that can scale and have full topology view. So when this technology is deployed, it's deployed on a point-to-point -point basis. Every link is unique to the endpoint from the cloud, and its control plane is unique to that IP address. And, and as a result of that, basically that central endpoint in the data center um, is able to keep a full image of the topology and, and have full uh, control of that as well. And that's fundamentally sort of the, uh, sort of the, uh, the elements of what's really powerful about this technology. The networking side is easy. It's layer two, layer three, packet forwarding. A lot of vendors are doing special things there in terms of restoration capabilities, routing, uh, control, you know, um, quality of service, should I say. But fundamentally, it's all about the autonomous provisioning and orchestration and control capabilities this, this brings. So why is it important? The reason why this is important, especially for branch offices, is that um, it really comes down to CapEx and OpEx. Um, you want to have, a, what, what end customers, what end business customers want is they want to have fast connectivity that's cheap and, and basically easy to deploy and have access to the cloud in a manner where they have some of the controls in terms of accessing apps and services that they need to drive their businesses and thereby basically operate a lot more efficient and productive. That, that's fundamentally uh, what the, the goal here is. And this technology, as I mentioned, gives you that mechanism. You can now have internet access in a manner where you can, you can make configuration changes uh, on the fly or more autonomously and basically uh, in a manner that's a lot more affordable than what the existing infrastructure provides. Um, as a data point, an MPLS port is roughly three to four times more expensive than a native Ethernet port. So there's, there's an immediate um, CapEx implication there. The OpEx inf implication um, is a lot more significant, especially if you're looking at uh, a managed service from a telco. Sometimes that's a truck roll to a remote site, for example versus having a, um, you know, the ability to provision a connection. 
Security is another aspect that's very important um, in this arena. Uh, so having encrypted tunnels is just the first line of defense here. Um, you know, uh, breaches are very um, sophisticated these days. And that's why um, a lot of companies, a lot of ISVs are now offering security sort of firewalling capabilities or add-ons to, uh, in order to make these types of services a lot more robust. Um, some market data around um, SD-WAN, uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's been embraced globally now as a means of basically transforming the infrastructure for the future. Uh, that future um, as a vision is essentially end customers or subscribers enjoying a rich base of apps, whether these are video gaming apps or business apps, um, basically making life a lot more um, efficient, but then also information rich. Um, coming back to reality, today, uh, as reported by Ovum, 33% of VPN connections are associated with SD-WAN connectivity. I mentioned just a little while ago that uh, you need to have, when SD-WAN is deployed, it's typically over an IPsec, it, it's IPsec connections, IPsec-based connections or VPN tunnels. And, and so this is, you're already seeing some of the impacts there. Um, basically, um, the data point also highlighting the fact that um, the, um, you know, $3.5 billion in terms of the many service offerings. And that's just the start. We, we, we're just starting here. When you're looking, you start projecting out 10 years from now, and, you know, the world could be very different. So bringing it down in terms of how it impacts the infrastructure, um, universal CPE, or SD-WAN as a technology, uh, is really three points of focus or three points of disruption as we often refer to it uh, internally in the end-to-end -end infrastructure or the topology. Um, we talked about the customer premise itself. So this could be a, a large office environment. You could have your SDN control that, um, situated in uh, headquarters, for example, if it's just a native enterprise-only deployment, extending out to branch remote offices. In terms of a telco infrastructure or a managed comm service provider infrastructure, um, the central office or the point of presence, uh, often uh, that's a point of DMAR. And so that um, is also a focus point in terms of that transformation around SD-WAN. And then ultimately, it's the back end, it's the data center, the, the cloud environment. So these are the three points of transformation as it relates to this technology. Um, Today, if I give you a market readout, most SD-WAN uh, technologies are deployed as a bare metal implementation. Um, the term bare metal, is essentially from simplistic terms, is where it's not virtualized. When this technology first came out, um, there was this notion that this is going to be a BNF. Um, but the reality is the way it's being deployed today, which makes sense, is it's, it's just simply a connection that where the control layer has been uh, um, is, is completely separate and it's software defined, but the connectivity is just basically native IP over Ethernet. Um, that's, that's basically what it is. A, a cheap way of getting to the internet, for example. Um, now, having said that, I didn't want to dummy it down too much. This infrastructure, given its SDN control capabilities, becomes the on ramp for future services, which can be virtualized, and I'll talk about that in a second here. So how is SD-WAN deployed? And this essentially comes down to three deployment scenarios or three options. Option number one is hybrid. So last year, uh, 2017, everyone was talking about hybrid WAN. The ability to basically peel off SD-WAN based connectivity from an MPLS based infrastructure. The CP device itself operates in both modes, a gateway mode. The problem with those devices was, of course, you're going to pay a cost and uh, management, service management premium because it, there's a lot more feature functionality in there. And this, and this capability is still there, um, and it's still being deployed. Today, a year into this, we're hearing more and more about SD-WAN being deployed just natively as an overlay over the existing uh, MPLS infrastructure, which basically brings about option two, where you have a branch office 
the equipment in the branch office has depreciated from a, a cost standpoint, from a financing standpoint, to the point where it's ready for repair. And the IT manager basically says, all right, I'm going to deploy in an SD-WAN appliance and all my services are going to transition over that. The third option is um, essentially where there's sensitivity to ripping out equipment, but you have the functionality in place to migrate your, um, your CPE device to support SD-WAN connectivity. Um, access routers is a classic example where you can basically you know, um, pay for an SDK upgrade, deploy an SD-WAN OS, and, and that same equipment will then allow you to have that functionality. Um, the, the, the thing that's really allowed and, and holds promise uh, for this technology is the fact that it can be deployed as an overlay, an overlay of the existing infrastructure. And, and this is the reason why um, a lot of the telcos, comm service providers around the world are embracing this. They want to leverage their existing infrastructure in a manner that's non-disruptive and easy to scale. And, um, and so what I'm, what I'm trying to show in this next slide is an example where you've deployed a network, the SDN controller resides in the cloud or in the data center as a point of centralized control, and then you're gonna have CPE devices sitting at each branch office. Um, these branch offices can communicate with one another, uh, or they can connect directly to the, uh, to the data center and essentially that SDN controller that sits at the data center will have com a complete topological view of every device that's connected to it on a point-to-point -point basis, a unique IP address. And for this reason, I mean, and, and the technology being used is just VLAN technology, right? And, and for this reason, this spoke architecture that you have um, can basically be scaled. Um, you have a, sing a single topological view uh, where the control is completely separate from the networking side, from the data networking side of the world. And whenever there's a configuration change on any of the devices, new features going, then you can basically broadcast that out or uniquely identify branch offices where you need an upgrade. So this is very powerful in the sense that if you want to roll out new services or if there's a, a configuration change request, it can be done very autonomously all in one go. Uh, in, in, in call it one update or uniquely in, um, for each uh, office, for example. Um, so, so overlay, um, being able to leverage the existing infrastructure is definitely one big barrier to adoption of this technology. Looking at uh, the infrastructure in a completely different dimension to the one I showed, um, this, this next slide um, essentially gives you a segmentation view. You'll have a SOHO, a small office, home office, uh, um, you know, you're, you're talking about like five employees or, or, or less, scaling all the way up to a large branch. That large branch could be a headquarters. And the business needs, depending upon the type of branch you're in or the types of use cases are gonna vary. So for example, a SOHO office, two to five employees, they basically need Fast, in internet, um, fast access to services, fast connectivity, but nothing too much beyond that. So some routing, SD-WAN is sufficient. As you look at the other end of the infrastructure, then there's gonna be more apps and services, you know, finance department, human resources, et cetera, et cetera. A lot more need for security and different types of policy management around um, apps and services that they have. So it's essentially bringing about a lot more um, security use cases, um, some NATing capabilities or G-NATing capabilities. Um, you could even have wireless access, for example, from an infrastructure connectivity standpoint. So those use cases are gonna scale. And from an Intel standpoint, we, we basically are looking at this very uniquely. Our mission is to identify use cases and say, okay, how this particular use case, how can it run best uh, from a performance and scaling standpoint on um, Intel Silicon. And as such, uh, what we have is a line of CPU products ranging from the low end, the Atom-based processors, all the way up to the Xeon SP or the server sockets, so the heavy duty work that happens uh, in, in, the, in the cloud environment. So for the CPE world, you can break this down into three segments. There's the Atom processors for the low end of the market, 
Um, and the feature functionality of the APIs will be common, but the packet processing will be according to that, that, that segment of the market. Mid-range is the Xeon D line, and then you've got the, the heavy-duty Xeon SPs at the high end of the market. DBDK, there was a question about how DBDK comes into play here. So almost every vendor designing, um, either from an ISV standpoint or an OEM standpoint, um, products for SD-WAN or, or virtual ICPE is using DBDK today. Um, essentially for acceleration of packets, it's, the data, it's acceleration of the data plane. Um, getting more out of the packet processing capabilities than you would otherwise. Um, and, um, and, and this we expect to continue as you move forward. Hyperscan is being used by many vendors, again as an accelerator, uh, where security uses are, are, um, are being employed. So capabilities where pattern matching is used, um, certainly in next generation firewalls, um, it's there um, you know, as a, as a, to provide the extra performance boost. And then, of course, QuickAssist technology, that's our crypto technology. So QuickAssist is being now uh, uh, adopted or embraced in the CP space um, very quickly uh, in contrast to even a year ago. The ASNI instruction set for driving crypto workloads um, was more than sufficient, but the bandwidth push um, you know, for these classes of devices now and the fact that your, your connectivity is scaling and each connection is, um, is, is, is VPN tunnel is driving crypto demand. And so Quickness is basically um, uh, is, is coming into play as well. What do we do at uh, Intel from a uh, CPE standpoint? I, I used to get these questions internally. People would be like, hey, you guys are, you guys are a CPU company. Why do you care about CPE? It's, it's like, no, we... We, we care very, we, you know, the, the CPE is the heart of that device. And, and so what we do from a segment standpoint uh, on a daily basis is focus on reference designs. Reference designs where we believe these are cost optimized, these are optimized from a performance standpoint, and then they map into uh, end user requirements. Those are the three functions um, that we take into consideration uh, when publishing reference designs. These reference designs, and I've shown an example here, basically go to our ecosystem. Uh, that ecosystem in this case would be hardware vendors like ODMs or OEMs. Versa Networks is a really good partner of ours and uh, another um, I, familiar face, but uh, he's, he challenges us <laughs> on, uh, on every facet of design and cost, and, uh, but we have, uh, we have very good collaboration there. But it's an example where we, they are an ISV or an OEM and they're delivering CP equipment SD-WAN is the focus. We publish these reference designs, we show them, and basically they, they have their own work in progress, but there's this sense of collaboration where you can uh, optimize from a cost and performance standpoint, and then you build around those. ODMs are essentially doing the same thing. Um, then what we do, and, and this example I'm showing here is, a, is for a small office design. You have a piece of silicon. In this case, it's a two-core atom processor and then what you need to do is focus on your I.O., your connectivity. So for a small branch office or a small office CPE, what, what's the connectivity requirements and what type of use cases can you support there or what, what the market needs? That, that's kind of what we do from a segment, uh, a segment standpoint. So in this example here, we've got a two-core atom, um, and then we have a number of PCI um, interfaces to allow different types of options. Or Ethernet ports, for example, um, there's PCI plug-in options, uh, whether it's PCIe or USB for wireless connectivity. Could be an LTE card for backup, as an example, or connection to a wireless network. It could be Wi-Fi, facing into the customer environment. Um, you're going to need memory, right? So there's DRAM memory, uh, the option for SATA, uh, MMC, um, and then essentially um, some flash options as well. And those are the types of things you need just as a base level. And then it comes down to, hey, do you want plain Ethernet connectivity or do you need to connect this into a DSL network or a PON network? Again, you know, these are, these are considerations in the designs. And so we have like a whole family of reference designs going from very small footprints to the very large sort of infrastructure-based um, heavy iron type uh, products. 
The other side of the equation is software. This is a lot more complicated. Um, and it's complicated because software gives you a lot more flexibility. It's the way of the future, right? SDN in itself is all about software and, and being autonomous. What you see here is the proposed reference architecture that Intel stands behind in terms of what we believe um, is the framework for NFVI. NFVI meaning from a world of CPE, it's the ability to support multiple VNFs, third-party VNFs that get onboarded onto a particular common piece of hardware. Um, and so what we're, if, I, if I walk you through this and give you a mapping of kind of some of the optimizations we've done here, you essentially have your, you have your CPE hardware and it's running some type of system on a chip processor, uh, the CPU. And then basically on top of that, you're gonna have your host OS or your, your uh, distribution. Um, as a market readout, a lot of folks, uh, almost in this space, almost everyone's using Linux, but then it's the packaging of that. Uh, Ubuntu is a very common uh, distribution. CentOS, Fedora, uh, you guys will be familiar with all of this. And so what we're doing is we're making sure those networking fabrics or stacks are optimized to run best for these types of architectures. Um, and, and as such, um, there's a whole family of ingredients that Intel provides. DBDK we've talked about, Quick Assist we've talked about, Hyperscan. Uh, Open vSwitch, we have an optimization there to enable um, you know, performant VNFs. A lot of folks are using SRIOV, so we have an optimization for that as well, and so forth. When you correlate that to individual OEM designs, not everyone's using everything, right? But it's there as a, if you need to. And that's the nice thing about why everyone is basically using the Intel architecture to design their products, because we have this consistency of hooks in place, whether it's a small device you're designing or whether it's a high-end system, there's optimizations and acceleration options that you can leverage on a consistent basis. So this consistent architecture view is highly valued, especially by the common service providers. With that in place, then you get into sort of the mechanics of virtualization. So KVM is our choice of hypervisor, and it happens to be um, that of um, the common service providers as well. But there's nothing stopping you from other hypervisors, right? So whether it's a VMware environment, you can certainly adopt that. But KVM is something that uh, we, we view as very important. And a lot of the, the community, the, OE, the CPE communities, are designed around that as well. Um, and then you get into the use cases. Um, as I mentioned, SD-WAN bare metal is being deployed today. And you know, the, the industry is looking into onboarding VNS. Some are more progressive than others. Some are still looking at this from an evaluation standpoint. But ultimately, the end game is a CPE device that's running a reference stack of this nature. You know, you're gonna have variations from one vendor to another, but are fundamentally of this, you know, having the mechanics as, uh, as shown here. And then each end customer, whether it's an enterprise or a, a service writer, are gonna have a different portfolio of VNFs, uh, third-party VNFs that they're gonna onboard. That's, uh, and you know, and then depending upon the size of device, one of the, one of the big challenges we um, wrestle with every day is we get asked the question, hey, Intel, for a particular class of hardware, how many VNFs or how many use cases can I support and what does the performance profile of that look like? And so the larger the box, the more you require, right? But that's not necessarily the market requirement. The market requirement, they still want it to be cheap but they want to load it you know, as much as they can, and they want room for growth for the future. So there's a very careful, complex calibration there that we have to navigate through. Any questions so far? Is this all making sense? How many people are familiar with the, the FAST data project, FIDO, in association with the Linux Foundation? So this is getting into the open source world of uh, technology. Um, and DPDK is being used by FIDO. It's, it's a Linux uh, foundation project in conjunction with Cisco. Cisco basically came out with a technology to accelerate I.O. 
fundamentally, and they, they open source this. And Linux happens to be basically um, a really good starting point in terms of building a worldwide community presence around this. Um, we're excited because DPDK is uh, a part of this, and so we're pushing the FIDO agenda as well. It's, it fundamentally serves, DPDK fundamentally accelerates packet processing, so it helps to serve the agenda here. Um, and, uh, and so for CPE designs, equally, uh, we are you know, influencing and, and discussing um, designs that take advantage of, um, of uh, sort of the FIDO framework as well. Uh, here's an example of um, some of the fruits of our work here. Um, this is from Dell, a very good partner of ours from the hardware standpoint. We introduced uh, one of the target pieces of silicon um, called Skylake D, um, uh, basically early this year. And so they, they were first to market with a commercially built uh, appliance uh, around Skylake D. Skylake D is essentially the, the, the Skylake processor that's been shrink-wrapped for sort of the mid-market. And um, so you see from the form factor, it's a one year, essentially a server, but it's, it, it provides the same functionality set, but a lot more economical, but not as performant as a server socket, but uh, a full blown server socket, should I say. Um, but um, these types of technologies is really what the, the industry is embracing to get you the performance and scale that you need for, for the types of services we're talking about here. SD-WAN being you know, the fundamental there. On the other side, I was talking about different classes of CP. Uh, here's an example from one another partner of ours, Silicon, um, who are basically delivering um, a whole family of devices. And what you see here is uh, sort of examples of uh, small CPEs designed around Atom. So Skylake D being a much larger sort of server-based footprint, and, and here you have basically Atom for the small desktop type of CPE that you would see in a very small office. Um, in the guts of this, the APIs, the functionality, the quick assist, um, the DPDK, it's all common and consistent. So it's just basically sizing to the, uh, the type of uh, deployment that you're looking at. And these are all designed around the reference, uh, these are all designed around the reference uh, design work that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, so sub-entry, um, this is an area that's very progressive and it's getting a lot of attention in the marketplace. Um, this, this notion of how can you scale SD-WAN technology all the way down to basically, you know, a two to five employee person, you know, employee base office or even lower, the Soho, you know, a couple of people, um, that type of device. and. Ultimately, there is a hypothesis that maybe this will, you know, if the, if the economics work, maybe this will one day get down to the residence, you know, where you're using it for more of the sort of the mainstream consumer side of the market. We'll see whether that happens. There's a lot of challenges, but right now, the sub-entry for the small office, two to five employee base, it's happening, it's beginning to happen. We started looking into this last year. We now have an ecosystem of hardware vendors basically providing products the former slide there, um, but we, again, we have um, reference designs sort of to drive this. The industry, uh, from an Intel, Intel standpoint, our, our agenda is to basically serve the market needs the best we can in terms of the technologies we have available. Uh, just more reviews of our processes here. It's, it's not meant to be a sales pitch, but what I wanted to highlight is that from a roadmap standpoint, Generation over generation, you know, our goal is to basically make big strides in terms of functionality performance. Um, so the former generation to the, the, the Xeon D 2100, which uh, went launched earlier this year, is roughly a 30 to 40 percent gain in performance. Um, you know, and then uh, basically uh, 3x in some cases. So these are big numbers, but you know, when you look at it across the types of use cases we're looking at. It, you know, 30 to 40 percent is, is, is more, you know, is typically what we what would expect, which, which is significant. 
Here's another example of work we're doing in terms of I.O. So what you see here on the right-hand side of the slide is a DSL module, right? ADSL, VDSL, where if you want to connect into a, um, a DSL infrastructure, it's a plug-in option. So we, we, we come up with reference designs there. Um, also, just in the same vein, um, you, you're going to need Wi-Fi modules and, and, and so forth. So um, this is definitely you know, some of the key capabilities there. So in summary, um, the CPE world, uh, the universal CPE world is, is definitely taking shape. Um, and SD-WAN is taking off. Um, the, um, basically, our focus moving forward is going to be on the enablement of VNFs um, for basically universal class to truly deliver on the promise of, uh, of universal CPE and NFV. And, um, and we're, we're excited to be working with sort of the ecosystem vendors that we have in play right now, both from a hardware and software standpoint. Um, what we are seeing as a, as, a, as, a, as a closing point in terms of infrastructure and a market trend is, and you've probably heard this before, the data center and the cloud has really been centralized and it's serving its purpose and those cloud environments are growing big. So they're scaling. The next motivation is consumption. How do you make it easy for end customers or endpoints to be able to consume what's available in that cloud? And the way to do it, you have to scale towards the customer. So edge compute is becoming very important. Edge compute, another way of referring to edge compute is um, it's, it's taking the data center closer to the customer premise. And that's, that's something that's um, being talked a lot about now. SD-WAN, gives you that um, capability in the, in the nature of the technology that I talked about and uh, the SDN aspects of it. So, uh, so there's going to be a lot more coming down the road. It's, it's, it's a market that's very exciting and you're probably reading a lot of news about it and uh, we welcome working with you guys on this. Very uh, quiet crowd. I see someone's falling asleep in the back. <laughs> Question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes. So uh, it seems like uh, for SD1, uh, VPN or encryption is a common practice. Um, fundamental, yeah. Yeah, we, we do. The content we have, um, sorry, the question is, um, so the con there was a comment that um, encryption or VPN is, is a must-have to this, to SD-WAN, which it is. Every connection is a, is a VPN tunnel, and whether we have any benchmark data that can be shared um, around our silicon. And so a lot of the content that we publish from a benchmarking standpoint is NDA, uh, but as a general public statement, um, for an Atom class device, that's the small devices, uh, for an IPsec use case, uh, which is kind of what you're talking about, you know, you, you can expect anything north of 500 megabits worth of throughput. In, and it's going to vary from one workload to another, and, and, you know, and what else is running on the CPU. But uh, in an optimized case, you can even sort of get six to 700 you know, megabits throughput. Um, and of course, on the, the higher end products, you're going to expect a lot more. I hope that gives you enough sort of uh, categorization. So, um, so uh, the question was: there are a lot of SD WAN vendors in the market, and how does Intel differentiate itself? We don't. We want, to, ideally, we want all the vendors on a common architectural plane, but they don't want that. <laughs> um, so we, we, we essentially provide the mechanics of building products. Um, and, um, but I, we, we certainly have the inherent um, capabilities to allow developers to build unique, you know, sort of differentiating value-added capabilities on top of that. Versa Networks, for example, they've got a very market-leading um, offering um, and they've designed around the Intel architecture. 
and um, very impressed. Still, um, uh, from the cost point, uh, how is it built planning to um, address arms? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so the question was um, cost points, right? There's a lot of sensitivity around cost uh, with, with CP generally. generally. And the smaller the device, the more cost sensitive it gets. And there's no question about it that our one of another company that basically has a CPU offering is ARM, uh, or a, a family of companies that have adopted the ARM architecture, should I say. Um, and so here's the market dynamic. As, as the market evolves and you're striving for differentiation, especially on the hardware side, basically the market wants lower cost devices, um, and, and they, but they want everything, all the speed and the functionality and the performance, everything there. So we, we, from a roadmap standpoint, are certainly look, looking at this. Um, and then, obviously, from a deal-to-deal -deal basis, we try and compete uh, as best as possible. But if extracting from that, in the, in the context of today's forum, the one unique differentiation we have is the breadth of product. Uh, I mentioned the end-to-end -end from uh, the very small office we now have coined the term sub-entry, which is not just entry level, but going down to the two to five employee uh, base using uh, Atom, all the way up to the data center. But having the APIs, having the functionality, the crypto sort of um, library set, being consistent. Um, consistent in the sense that, and, and, and so from a buying behavior standpoint, when you look at comm service providers and enterprises, they like that. Um, the fact that they can pick products based on one single common architecture and get the value added capabilities all the way through their uh, different classes or different points of termination. The one thing that demonstrates is you get much better overall network response, right? There's the, the uh, perform, call it performance throughput, call it latency, optimizations, etc. versus if you had a fragmented architecture where you're using one type of silicon in one class of products and a different in the other. Connections traversing through that type of fragmented environment will have to basically be reprocessed, um, not take advantage of all of the acceleration capabilities, for example, that we have or vice versa. But um, ultimately, our goal is to provide the best price performance you know, from a scaling standpoint. Um, so to Ananda's question even more pointed, our goal is to be price competitive across the board. Um, and then, of course, the details beyond that become NDA focus. <laughs> uh, maybe I have a question. Uh, maybe this is more like a question for Versa, actually, but uh, I'll ask you a question. So, so how do I scale if I have like a small box, like with two of, you know, four employees, let's say, you know, a year later I'm like, like 20 or 30 Mm -hmm. Am I supposed to stack some of these boxes, or how do I scale, or just to show, show them out? What's the, uh, what's your so, or what's so, so it really comes down, so the answer to your question, um, so the, the question, oh, well, I guess you've used the mic, but to answer your question, it really depends upon the types of use cases you plan to support day one, versus how much room, how much processing provision do you need for future services? Right? And it comes down to planning. So for example, for a two to four employee office, like the types of small boxes that I showed, the desktop type, that's more than sufficient. You're gonna probably be able to squeeze two, you're, you're probably gonna be able to squeeze like an SD-WAN use case running, which gives you your connection, plus some type of security, maybe some type of small firewalling capabilities. A 30 employee um, company is, it's, it's a slightly different class of device in the sense that you're going to have a lot more I.O. connectivity needed, a lot more Ethernet ports, for example, um, you know, um, and, and possibly even setting up security policies for individual, you know, if it's a department. All of those things will consume more cores, right, from a workload standpoint. So it could be a different class of device. Or you could decide day one that you're going to have a slightly performant, higher performant platform in a small environment 
but you, you provision 50% of it for future growth. So you don't have to rip it out and, and put another one in. So the scale, you can look at scaling in two dimensions. One is you either for a larger office space, you have a different class device or something that doesn't require a rip out, but you're gonna pay a bit of a premium up front, but everything's there for the next two years, for example, you know, or three years. Um, but the third dimension, as I mentioned, is the number of use cases. How many apps and services do you need? If it's just, if it's just SD-WAN, IPsec connectivity, you can go lower and be cheaper device. Just like your iPhone, really. It's the same sort of. Yeah, it's So when it comes to like white boxes, do you see a lot of traction from vendors for white boxes like uh, WeWork? Good Red question. Mm -hmm. The past and and versa, as a matter of fact. Uh, I mean, in terms of the incumbents like Cisco and Juniper versus you know white boxes, what do you can you kind of like provide us with some sort of insight or who is doing more on SD WAN? Who, who are you selling more to? I'll, I'll give you a I'll, I'll give you a non NDA answer. answer. <laughs> The, uh, so here's, here's a quick market readout, so now that you mentioned white boxes. So our view is white box, the, the, the model, will basically take off probably starting next year. Uh, it's been driven primarily by the comm service providers, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a mode of operation that's now becoming attractive in various other verticals. I'll, I'll just, I'll get to you in a second. Um, but um, the... But, but it's, it's, it's a, a real, real shift in the way business is done, right? So conventionally, you load an image on a piece of device, and it gets drop shipped, and there's a user manual there. Once you get into a white box model, the world of software is completely separate. It's almost like the, the same analogy as the control plane and the data plane are separate, right? And it's a lot more scalable. The end consumer has a lot more cost control, I guess. There's an economies of scale advantage there. But the implementation aspects, there needs to be a system integrator that plays into this. You, you mentioned Cisco and others. Um, I would say pretty much everyone's uh, embracing this model, uh, the white box model. Now, from a consumption standpoint, it, it's n our, our readout of the market is it's happening. Some service writers are basically starting to employ that now but I would, it's nowhere near what you would call prime time. It's gonna take several years before it gets into prime time. If that, you know, we'll see. So my, my take is starting next year, you'll start seeing more and more people basically consume white boxes. And, and those that have got it right, right? Or those that are working with system integrators that are, are doing the gluing and the packaging for, for, the, uh, for, the, for the service providers. But, um, if you look five years on, I think it's going to become a mode of operation in this new sort of transformational world. So, so the first question is, is that going to be driven by the cost point? It's hugely driven by the cost point. Um, the, the end consumer wants to take control of the hardware, right? They want to control cost. Exactly right. That's, it's, that's the motivation at the outset. Otherwise, um, so, because the, the, the conventional model has been that the, the vendor does everything for you, but you're going to have a premium. There's a price premium associated with it built into the margin of the product. And what these folks, what the service providers want to do is in the CP business, they want to squeeze every penny. Because every penny they're spending, they would rather save that 
and that apply to their top line. Um, so it's absolutely right. So, so yeah, so my third question as a, a follow-up then is that, so uh, estimate today from Mary is on this uh, enterprise, right? right. That's, that's, that's what I touched on a couple of times. If you ask me personally, I say yes. It's gonna, it's, it seems to be heading that way. The question is how long will it take? Just from our observation standpoint, we've gone from within the last two years, we've, we've had a significant push in terms of cost points and how deep you go into the market. If you talk to the service providers, the, you know, the AT&Ts and the Verizons, et cetera, they're looking at SD-WAN, they've embraced the technology. There's no question about it, right? They, they, they think it's the next best thing since sliced bread. The problem they have is they have to make the business case work from an infrastructure capex and opex standpoint. So, and it's, it comes down to economies of scale. The larger the subscriber base you have running on SD-WAN, the bigger the business case in terms of revenue opportunity, right? The, 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 the lock-in, or the number of customers you're locking in basically represents network build. If, um, so, this, so the only way they're gonna do that is obviously the first line of, you know, your first target base is the enterprise. But if you can make this technology work economically and from a scaling standpoint to reach the individual users like us, you're, you're going from you know, thousands or tens of thousands of businesses to suddenly you're talking of millions, you know, of subscribers. That's a huge jump in um, the economies of scale and the revenue opportunities that brings about, you know, that comes about as a result of this. Because once each endpoint is SD1 enabled, you know, you, every, every endpoint, basically, what that basically means is every endpoint is now connected to the cloud. So the world of possibilities for future services, on-ramping different types of use cases, it opens the world up to this, this new sort of fabric of, call it the future. Um, versus, if it doesn't go that way, then it's the question of like how many, how many branch offices can we secure? You know, it's all about subscribers and economies of scale. I, I personally believe it's going down that way, but I think it's gonna take a bit of time. I sort of mentioned hypothetically um, a couple of years, but uh, we'll see. I think time's up, right? All right. So wrap, guys. Thanks for your patience. I know it's <laughs> I know it's late, um, and I hope this was good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have Anike here? Okay. So uh, now we have <coughs> Anike up next. Uh, he is going to talk about security on Open Contrail. Um, he's senior product manager for the Contrail suite of products in Juniper Networks. Prior to Juniper, he's been another other network equipment vendor companies, including. Yes, Cisco, Allied Telecent, and Forster Network in engineering roles in areas of networking software ranging from protocols, device drivers, to network OS, SDKs, SDN, and LFPs. He has a master degree in computer science from USC and a graduate certificate in management science and engineering from Stanford University. So, uh, welcome, Maniket, now. Looks like uh, having uh, setting up. Oh, okay. <coughs>
Is it set to mirror or you want me to set it to mirror? Which to which one? Uh, No, here, black magic and then Promising. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mic is good. To turn this on. Yeah. Oh, so much I can see this. This one. One of these are buried behind the other. Thank you for your flexibility. Oh. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Is your mic on? Knock, knock. Hello. One, two, three. Okay, turn that one. Oops. Okay, that's good. And what about the other one? No, oh, you're making noise. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> that one, that one. Mic testing. testing, one, two, three. All right. Good evening, and uh, before I start, I want to first thank uh, Sujata, Michelle, and the team at Intel for giving us the platform, and a shout out to our uh, friends at Lenovo. Now, a quick introduction, Michelle, I mean, Sujata has already introduced. I'm uh, one of the product managers for the Contrail suite of products. And uh, the Contrail suite of products is based off of an open source project called Tungsten Fabric. Tungsten Fabric was formerly called as uh, Open Contrail, and Tungsten Fabric is now a Linux Foundation project. So what I'm here to talk specifically about is the product that was built on top of the foundations of a software-defined networking or a network virtualization offering to solve the problem of security in modern cloud environments, multi-cloud environments. So I'll keep the presentation real simple. The initial portion of the presentation, I'll try to build the problem statement. And uh, once that problem statement is kind of understood, I'm gonna move on to how we solve it and uh, the details of our, our solution. So first, let me start with the, what are the challenges we set out to solve with this security offering? What we set out to do is there were, a number of, uh, there were a number of problems associated with the traditional ways of, uh, of deploying and implementing security and the modern transformation of uh, data centers and uh, transformation of uh, how applications are deployed, that poses a lot of challenges. So if, if you look at this, uh, this graph, the x-axis is showing the number of different form factors of applications. Applications are increasingly the number and the different form factors of applications, the different environments in which applications are being deployed. That's growing very rapidly. Applications are being deployed on bare metal servers, on virtual machines, in 
in containers now, on, in on-premise environments, in public cloud environments. And on the y-axis, what you see is the number of um, bad things that applications need to be protected from, like viruses, malware, data leak prevention, and so on and so forth. The number of things that they, these applications need to be protected from, that is constantly growing uh, with every passing day. And therefore, this tends to have a multiplicative effect on the security posture, and the security posture that security administrators end up having to author, that, that translates to an explosion in, an, in the number of policies to adequately secure the applications. Now, one is the explosion in the number of policies, but more importantly, these, these policies, they rely very heavily on network coordinates. When you're authoring security policies, you try and identify the endpoints that need to be secured in the security policies. And to identify these endpoints, traditionally, uh, we have all relied on using the network coordinates such as IP addresses, VLANs, subnets, et cetera to identify the endpoints that need to be protected. Now, in modern cloud environments, as workloads are constantly mobile, they're moving constantly from one compute to the other, from one data center to the other, or from one cloud to the other. And therefore, their network coordinates are constantly changing, constantly evolving, and therefore, the policies have to keep pace with the changing network coordinates. So there's a constant churn in the set of policies uh, that, that, are, that need to be written. Further, traditional security has also centered around the notion of perimeter security, of, of securing your perimeter because, and for, for, for explaining this point, I'll, I'll go to my next slide, which is basically the traditional model of uh, securing the perimeter is, is a, a good analogy to explain that is how people protect their protected castles in the, ancient, uh, in the ancient days. Everything inside the castle was considered as um, stuff that needs to be secured, stuff that needs to be protected. And to protect the castle and the interiors of the castle, people built, um, uh, they dug a moat around the castle, and then there was a drawbridge to cross the moat. Now, the drawbridge was constantly protected by security guards, and um, towards the end of the day, the drawbridge was, was the, the strings were pulled and the bridge was uh, closed. So long as the, the, the drawbridge was closed and no marauder is allowed to enter via the drawbridge, everything inside the castle was considered secured and protected. But if a marauder, if a bad guy were to actually breach that drawbridge and enter the castle, then they could wreak havoc within the, within the inside of the castle. So that's the traditional model of, of perimeter-based security, of securing your perimeter. It, it, it relies on the assumption that securing my perimeter is sufficient, but they, they, they don't account for the fact that if the perimeter were to be breached, what prevents the lateral spread of threats uh, and, and for a virus or a malware wrecking havoc within the data center, horizontally, laterally, within the data center, within your cloud environment? So, those are some of the challenges associated with the traditional model. And because we are on analogies, I would like to give another analogy to explain what needs to happen. What is our hypothesis? Our hypothesis is that what needs to happen is a little more akin to a modern hotel. Now, trace back to the steps uh, that you take when you, when you go to a hotel. The first thing you are encounter, you encounter some uh, security guards, some doormen uh, at the entrance of the hotel. When you walk in um, at the reception desk, at the lobby, you have to first present your uh, identification and then your credit card. So your financial cred credentials and your identity are first verified and um, they are first uh, uh, evaluated. And then your room keys in the form of some badge, the, the room keys are issued to you. Now you use these room keys to access the elevator, to access your uh, room door, and then once you're inside your room, uh, then there is a safe within which you keep your belongings. So this model that, that of a modern hotel 
is, is exemplifies the multi-layer security model. The multi-layer security is something that needs to be there in modern cloud environments as opposed to the traditional model of a castle, moat, and drawbridge. So with that, the, the problem statement is kind of laid out. So I, I, I laid out the problem statement at a 10,000 feet level. Let's go down a little closer to real, real environments where applications are deployed. Let's take a classic multi-tier web application. Let's, um, for the example's sake, let's, let's just go with the uh, assumption that this application is currently being developed on OpenStack as the orchestration platform. So this application has three tiers. It has a web tier, app tier, and a, uh, and a database tier. And to secure this application, an instance of the policy is written. Let's call it P1. In the development cycle, in the development life cycle, this application graduates from the dev environment to a staging environment, and from a staging environment to a production environment. Now remember that at the, at the core, the application remains the same. It's only graduating from one environment to the other. And a result of that, the same application, there are three copies of the same application that are running in three different environments. And to secure this application, we end up writing an instance of the policy for every, uh, for every environment in which this application is deployed. You write an instance of the policy to secure the application in the dev, in the staging, in the prod environment. And fundamentally, the application is the same. Its security needs are, are the same, regardless of which environment it is deployed in. So ideally, if we were able to write a single instance of the policy for the application and, and make that policy be fungible across the different environments in which this application is deployed, that would help in uh, tremendously in reducing the complexity, in reducing the number of policy rules that need to be written. And obviously will translate to, uh, it'll scale better and be able to manage uh, policies, the, the security posture much better. Now, that example, we can extend a little bit further. My example talked about an OpenStack environment. What happens when a group within the organization comes along and says, we would like to start using the public cloud for building the web component? Another group comes along and says, yes, but we should also need to think about containerizing some components of this application. And we think Kubernetes is a good orchestrator. Another group comes along and says, no, but we think Mesos is a better orchestrator. And another group comes along and says, when it comes to deploying this application, uh, nothing beats classic bare metal servers uh, for deploying these, these applications. So what you can now see from this slide is not only is the same application deployed in different environments, but it is also deployed in different form factors, in a public cloud, in a containerized environment, and on bare metal servers. And application fundamentally is the same. So what we ideally want is to be able to define, review, and approve the policy once, and once that process has gone, uh, once the, the policy has undergone that process, we should be able to reuse that policy regardless of which environment it is deployed in or which form factor it is deployed in. Now, another thing we need to remember is, is that application developers, they know and understand their application best, and therefore, they know the security needs of their application. They understand this application, what are the intra-tier communications, and this application needs to communicate with what other external components. And therefore, they can best define uh, and, and help lock down the communication for, that, for their application. And therefore, there is a need to empower these application developers. And that need is well understood. What we must not forget is that central security administration teams, they are still, at the end of the day, accountable. They, they still need to have the authority and the oversight of all these policy uh, actions that are being taken. So they must always have the control and the oversight 
over individual policy decisions being made by individual application developers. We have to empower application developers and yet retain authority and control with central security administration teams. So that actually concludes the problem definition. And if, if, if that resonates with you guys, then the solution would be perhaps most intriguing to you guys. So what therefore, in response to the last few slides and the, the definition of the problem, what therefore was our take? How, how, did, we, um, how did we hypothesize we solved the, the, that problem? So our solution rests on three primary pillars. The first pillar is that there was an excessive reliance on network coordinates, on networking paradigm for authoring the security posture. And that proved to be especially costly in modern cloud environments where workloads are constantly mobile. Therefore, and, and secondly, the aspect of empowering application developers. And therefore, what that meant was the traditional way in which we've been authoring security policies that needs to somehow evolve such that policies can be um, the, the notion of expressing security intent needs to be abstracted such that application developers who understand their applications, they can express their security requirements in an abstract fashion. And there should be, it should account, the, the, the policy framework should account for this um, frequent and constant mobility of workloads. And to account for that, the reliance on network coordinates should, should reduce, and we should instead leverage the application attributes more uh, to express the security posture. So that is pillar number one. Now, pillar number two relates to visualization. Now, any security solution, the, the first and the most important thing it needs to address is to show to the security um, uh, administrators what is the current status of the security posture and what are the things that need their attention, uh, uh, most immediate attention. So show me things that need my immediate attention and what does the current posture look like? So that is answered by visualization. And the problem with traditional visualization solutions has been that they have been network centric and that needs to be more application centric. Administrators and application developers, they want to see the application topology and how the security posture overlays that application topology. That's what they want to see. And the third thing, very quickly, is that even for traffic that is east-west, that is within a data center or a cloud, the, the, there needs to be an ability to subject that traffic to not just L4 security, but also L7 security, things like intrusion detection systems. So traffic, whether it's north-south or east-west, needs to be subjected. Need, we, we, the solution, a security solution, needs to provide uh, the ability to subject selected traffic to not just L4 but L7 security as well. So based on these three pillars, we built our solution. And we had a good starting point in the form of a software-defined networking solution, a network virtualization solution, which had this centralized, logically centralized control and physically distributed uh, enforcement of security. So we had that foundation from about um, five, six years ago. And that, that software-defined networking, network virtualization solution, it was deployed in a number of customers. And so we had a lot of lessons to learn from the experiences of those customers using our um, uh, SDN solution. So we used those building blocks and we built the security offering that rests on these three pillars on top of that SDN fundamentals. So let's quickly arrive at how exactly do we address those three pillars that you saw in the previous slide. The first pillar was the evolution of the policy framework. So I'm going to explain that evolved policy framework on this slide. And to explain that, I'm going to go back to my favorite example of a multi-tier or three-tier web application. And to begin with, I'm going to focus on just the um, web and the app components of that application. And, and this could be any application. Let's say it's some kind of a CRM application. And 
between the web and the app, we obviously want to restrict the communication to just the HTTP or HTTP, HTTPS traffic. So therefore, I write the policy, as seen in the, the top of the slide, that says allow HTTPS traffic between the set of endpoints, <coughs> between the set of endpoints that are implementing my web tier and the set of endpoints that are implementing my app tier. Now notice that in that, and that's the exact syntax of the policy of the, of the security rule that needs to be written. That's the exact syntax. Now notice that in that rule, in that statement, there's not a single mention of an IP address or a VLAN or a zone or a subnet. Instead, what we are using to identify both the, 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 the traffic that needs to be permitted, the kind of traffic, as well as to identify the sets of endpoints, we are using some kind of variables or tags. So first, let's, let's look at the, the traffic that needs to be permitted between web and app. The traffic is just called as HTTPS traffic. Now, traditionally, we would have written a, a set of uh, pro protocol port pairs to identify the traffic. Instead, what we've done is we've hidden that list of protocol port pairs behind this tag. This tag says HTTPS traffic, and therefore, uh, this allows us to update that uh, protocol port pair combinations dynamically behind the scenes without having to rewrite this policy rule. Uh, then let's focus our attention to the set of endpoints. The first set of endpoints are labeled or, or, or are tagged tier equal to web. Notice that this could now mean that tier equal to web is being implemented in a virtual machine in a bare metal server that is non-virtualized, and it could even be running in a public cloud. So that's the beauty of this framework, that um, this applies regardless of, of, of the um, form factor of the application, whether it is non-virtualized, whether it is virtualized, running on any hypervisor, or it is running in the public cloud. So tier equal to web could map to a number of endpoints that even straddle across these environments. And so does tier equal to app. Now this is fine. This is the introduction of that policy framework. And this was one copy of the application running in the dev environment. What happens when this um, application graduates to a production environment? In the production environment, there's another copy of this application running, which has its own web and app tier. And look at the beauty of the, of the policy. The same policy continues to apply even for the copy of the application running in production. Except there is one catch. It allows communication between web and app, which also means it will allow communication between web of the dev application, of the dev copy of the application, um, and the app of the production copy of the application. Clearly, this is not desirable. We would want to block this kind of crosstalk. So our policy framework allows you to express that and says, allow HTTPS traffic between web and app, but make sure to match on their deployment. What that means is, so long as both web and app are in the same deployment, HTTPS traffic should be permitted. But if they do not have the same deployment, then do not permit the HTTPS traffic between them. So this crosstalk would be blocked. Now, this was just one site. Let's say this was in Santa Clara. And this organization opens another office in, let's say, London. And in London, there's another, dev or de there's another group of developers. And they also have a copy of the application that they are building and working on. Now, again, the policy can still protect this application, even running in the dev environment in London, except it's going to allow the web of the dev copy in Santa Clara to talk to the app in the dev environment in London. This crosstalk is also not very desirable. So we can extend the policy framework, the match clause, to match not just on deployment, but also on site. OK? Now, notice what's happening here. I have protected three copies of the application <coughs> running in two geographically disparate locations with just a single policy statement. If you were to use the traditional style of authoring security policies 
to, to accomplish the same security posture, it would have needed at least uh, six to seven policy statements, six to seven rules. So that exemplifies the power, the density of this, of this policy framework, while at the same time being so readable. Right? The policy is very, very readable. You don't have to go and trace uh, these IP addresses and subnets and um, which IP address maps to which endpoints in which geographical location. You don't have to go and trace the spaghetti. The, the policy is very, very readable. Now this example, this slide builds further on this example. And um, we add another copy of the application in staging. Then we add the third tier, which is the database tier. And then we write another rule for protecting the communication between, uh, between app and DB. With the DB, what we are trying to do is share the DB between the three uh, deployments. It may not be a very realistic, but we, we've done this to exemplify the power of the policy framework. To, so to show the policy framework, we've just um, relied on the assumption that the database is being shared between three different environments. But the, but the idea is to show you the policy framework here. Now, let's, let's build on this. This policy framework, what you saw was it was not using IP addresses, VLANs, but it was using tags. So what are these tags? Now, because this approach to security that relies on tags, now what are tags? These tags are basically um, capturing attributes of the application. So because this is a new approach, we decided to provide a framework for thinking about how to, uh, how to construct, how to create your tags and how to attach your tags. So that, that prescriptive framework, um, in line with that prescriptive framework, we came up with an initial set of uh, prescriptive tags. So what are those prescriptive tags? The first one is, what is your application? What uh, components does your application have? So which tiers comprise your application? Which environment your application is being deployed in? Is it a dev, is it a dev environment, a staging environment, etc.? And what's the geographical location in which your application is being deployed? So these four axes, they serve as an initial prescriptive framework to aid in how to think about this new security model. We have a fifth kind of a tag, which is basically the notion of a label. Now tags are basically key value pairs, and label has the key of label, and it can take any value. So it's, it's more free form. So we have these five initial prescriptive set of tags, and then we have the ability to create custom tags. If, if there's a need for um, other or more tags, there's ability to create more custom tags. There's other grouping constructs that we'd like to try, talk about. So the first one is a service group. The service group we, st we saw in the previous slide. In the previous slide, HTTPS hyphen traffic. That was the example of a service group. Now behind a service group is a list of protocol port pairs that can be updated dynamically. So that basically identifies the, the set of different uh, traffic combinations that need to be um, uh, considered in, in authoring that security rule. The other grouping construct is that of an address group. The address group um, basically gives the flexibility to use networking coordinates if you need to, to identify a set of endpoints. So the membership of an address group could be, it could be using tags, could be using labels, or some network constructs like IP addresses or prefixes. So that gives you more flexibility beyond just tags. And then finally, all the policy rules that are related, related to a specific application, they can be grouped together into an application policy set or an application policy group. So these other grouping constructs exist in our uh, security framework. Now, <clears throat> this whole notion rests on, on, on the concept of tags. So there are two questions that arise. First is, how do I create these tags? And how do I, um, you know, if I have to associate these tags with individual workloads, how does this operation really scale? 
So to address this notion of how do you scale this process of creating and associating tags with workloads, we came up with the idea of associating tags to different um, objects in the hierarchy. So because this, this uh, solution was born from our network virtualization solution, that network virtualization solution had this hierarchy of objects. First you have workloads. At the bottom of the hierarchy, you have workloads. The workloads may be bare metal servers that are non-virtualized, virtualized workloads in the form of virtual machines or containers. And each of these workload form factors has a logical interface on which the workloads receive traffic. So that's the bottom of the hierarchy. Now a number of workloads are grouped together into what are called as virtual networks. And a number of virtual networks may be grouped together inside uh, what is called as a project which may reflect, which may uh, correspond to the notion of a tenant. So therefore, we, we provided the flexibility to associate, uh, to associate tags either with the logical interface associated with workloads, with workloads themselves, or with the networks in which the workloads are present, or with the tenant or the project in which the workloads are present. So obviously that, that scales far better. If you associate a tag with a network, then all the workloads within that network automatically inherit that tag. So that's the, that's the uh, point of this slide. And the other point to note is that because there is a parent-child hierarchy of these uh, objects, tags associated with the parent objects get inherited down by all their child objects. And therefore, if you come down to an individual logical interface associated with a workload, it is eventually that logical interface which will have a, a, a set of tags associated with it and the set of tags associated with that logical interface will invoke the necessary uh, security policies that will define the security posture associated with that workload. So that's, um, that concludes the explanation of the policy framework. That was the pillar number one. Now moving to the pillar number two, which is basically the visualization. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the visualization, but what, but what we want to show here is that this visualization reflects the application topology. And what we mean by the application topology is that the outer circle represents the application and the environment in which the application is deployed. So let's say it's an HRMS application and it's the dev copy of the application or the HRMS application but the production copy of the application and so on. So the outer ring represents that and the inner ring represents the different components, the different tiers of those respective applications. And then you have arcs uh, that subtend um, inside the circles. Those arcs represent the different flows of traffic observed between those endpoints. And those arcs, those flows, uh, there is a color, uh, there's a color coding. The blue colored flows are policy compliant and the red colored flows are violating policy. And therefore those red colored flows are the flows that uh, deserve immediate attention of the security administrators. And what can be done, um, um, what can pot potentially be done based on this visualization is administrator goes to the red colored flows, um, double clicks and gets further information, further detail about the red colored flows, and then has the ability to simply translate that flow into an actual policy that either permits or blocks that traffic. The red colored flow simply means there is no policy associated with this flow the administrator would then go and speak to the uh, respective developers. Is this flow of traffic expected? And if this flow of traffic is expected, translate this flow into an actual policy that permits that traffic. And if it turns out to be an unexpected flow, then write a policy, translate that, uh, the presence of this flow into actual, actually a policy that blocks that kind of traffic. So that's the power of this visualization. And of course, um, this is the default visualization. This is the default display. And this display can be tuned. You want to see more applications, fewer applications, focus on one application, focus on just the public cloud, focus on just the on-prem. All sorts of combinations are possible and tunable. And this slide shows an example of the details of the flow. And on the right-hand side, it shows what are the policies 
uh, that are corresponding to this particular flow of traffic. So very quickly, I have about 10 minutes to go. So I quickly want to show the, um, the third pillar, which corresponds to the ability to subject traffic to not just L4, but L7 security. So our solution has a distributed enforcement software entity that sits on every physical host where, or if you talk about the public cloud, then it sits on every equivalent of EC2 instance. EC2 for the AWS, and it's equivalent for the other clouds. So where your workload is deployed, our enforcement entity sits on, on, that, uh, on that compute host. Um, and it natively provides up to L4 security. And because it sits in the data path, it also has the ability to forward or redirect traffic that is selected by policy to L7 next generation firewalls. Now, we are also working on a deeper integration with some uh, next generation firewalls that can be, that can be um, in some sense, collapsed with our L4 enforcement entity. And when that uh, integration is available, I'll, I'll, I'll share more details about that. But suffice to say that we have the ability to subject traffic not just to L4, but to L7 security as well. Now, in, in certain environments like Kubernetes, application developers are used to writing application manifests. And these application manifests um, identify different, uh, these application manifests call out different aspects of the way in which this application needs to be deployed. And the Kubernetes community, they came up with the notion of a uh, manifest for the network policy. They call it the Kubernetes network policy. And the community, they came up with a specification. And they called upon network vendors to write plugins, to write an implementation for that network policy spec. So what we have done is we have written an implementation for Kubernetes network policy that basically reads that network policy YAML file. Anytime an application developer issues the command kubectl minus f apply network policy dot YAML, our software is listening on the invocation of that API. And in response to the invocation of that um, apply of that network YAML, we are going to read and parse that network policy.yaml and create corresponding objects on the contrail side. So the, the workflow of creating policies associated with an application that's being deployed on Kubernetes, that workflow is completely automated. Um, that's extremely powerful, and this is the specific implementation, specific integration we have with Kubernetes. <coughs> Everything that you heard in the last few slides about that tag-based infrastructure, the, the notion of the, the aspects of creating tags, associating tags with Kubernetes pods, and then writing the policies that, that use those tags and secure these applications, that entire end-to-end -end workflow is completely automated and done in response to the invocation of the network policy YAML file. Uh, in addition to this, for, for deployments that straddle across the private and the public cloud, the aspect of secure connectivity between clouds becomes extremely important. Not just between clouds, but even within clouds. We have a lot of customers, uh, a lot of financial customers who come to us and say that they don't trust the, the pipe, the plumbing provided to them by uh, public clouds. So they wanted encryption not just between clouds, but also between workloads sitting on, let's say, two separate EC2 instances, let's say, in the public cloud. So we provide workload to workload encryption and cloud to cloud encryption as well. So that's basically the end-to-end -end security story. And what, what I'd like to conclude, the takeaway, that's the last slide that my computer ran out of battery. Uh, the, the last slide is basically the takeaway slide. The takeaway is that with the Contrail suite, the Contrail portfolio of products, what you now have is end-to-end -end network, security, analytics, and monitoring for on-prem, for the physical network, and for the public cloud, end-to-end -end consistent 
and the same set of uh, primitives for both networking and security and analytics and monitoring. So that basically concludes everything I wanted to say, I wanted to talk about. Um, and that gives us a few minutes to do some Q&A. Yeah, um, part of your orchestration platform is designed to open stack. This is not available for So good question. So the question was, the question was, what orchestration systems besides OpenStack does Contrail work with? Now, Contrail was born in the time when OpenStack was, um, um, the OpenStack wave was on the surge. And therefore, that was the first orchestration system that we began supporting. But we, we made a very conscious effort not to tie in any assumptions, not to tie in any dependency to specific orchestration systems. Every, every functionality of Contrail is exposed via northbound APIs, and it's these northbound APIs that allow us to integrate with any um, new kid on the block. So whether it is OpenStack, whether it is Mesos Marathon, whether it is Kubernetes, whether it is OpenShift, whether it is VMware, vCenter, or another uh, orchestrator, Contrail integrates with all of them. Because since inception, we've made this very conscious effort not to make any specific assumptions, not to make any um, architectural constraints that preclude us from integrating with other orchestrators. So is there any conflict between the security rules when you use different orchestrators? Uh, certainly not. So let me give a couple. I don't see how that's possible. Let me give, let me, let, let me substantiate that. Let's take the example of Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, there is this notion of uh, Kubernetes network policy, and what we do is we provide an implementation for Kubernetes network policy. Take OpenStack. OpenStack, the um, network and policy framework is, is specified via the Neutron APIs. So we provide an implementation for the Neutron APIs. So what we do, what we basically do as good citizens of that orchestrator ecosystem is we work with the interface that that ecosystem has prescribed. In the OpenStack ecosystem, the prescribed interface, the prescribed uh, uh, standard is Neutron. So we provide implementation for Neutron. Now where we want to provide uh, value add beyond what Neutron specifies, we provide extensions as well. But we, we, we make sure to abide by the interface, to avoid, abide by the conventions. Uh, in fact, specifically talking about OpenStack, there, is, there are automation frameworks in the form of um, heat, heat orchestration templates. So we also, um, whatever value add we've provided beyond Neutron, we've made sure to extend heat to even support those Neutron extensions that we've done, um, including supporting uh, OpenStack security groups and everything. So that's what I would say, that we, we make sure that we are good citizens of that orchestration ecosystem, and that's how we prevent any sort of a conflict with what that ecosystem uh, provides. All, 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 do all your rules um, or, uh, end up in uh, uh, NetBuilder? No. Um, Where else should they reside besides NetBuilder? So, if, if, if NetBuilder at all. Correct. So the question was, do all our rules ultimately boil down to some kind of net filter rules or equivalent? And the answer is no. Um, what we've done is the origins of our, our enforcement and our networking solution rely, lie on this um, network virtualization product. It has a centralized controller, and it has distributed enforcement entities. This distributed enforcement entity, we call it the FER node. FER stands for forwarding, enforcement, and reporting. So this entity, this software entity that resides on every host, compute host, where workloads are running and uh, uh, are running, this software entity provides forwarding as well as enforcement. And so um, our, our rules do not translate to net filter or IP tables or Windows firewall platform, none of those. The security rules translate to um, enforcement 
primitives for our FER node. Now this FER node, you, you can run this FER node on a KVM box, on a VMware ESX host, in the public cloud, or on a Windows box. And therefore, what you get by running that software entity in all of these platforms is complete consistency, complete feature parity across all your different environments. Versus, if you were to use a solution that translates these security rules to a Windows filtering platform, or IP tables, or net filter rules, or Berkeley packet filters, each of these do not have complete feature parity. BPF differs from IP tables, differs from Windows filtering platform, differs from net filters. For those reasons, we use our own enforcement agent, our own enforcement entity, put it on every compute host where uh, workloads run and reside, and get complete feature parity, complete consistency of not just the primitives to author security posture, but also the enforcement. No, so it's always good to use one or the other interface. If you decide to use the interface provided by, let's say, OpenStack, OpenStack is your chosen orchestrator, and you decide to use the interface provided by OpenStack, then go with Neutron and stick with Neutron. If you want to remain independent of the orchestrator, then Contrail provides you an interface. If you don't want to use the Neutron interface, Contrail provides you the interface. Now, if you choose to use both interfaces, there's always a chance of some um, uh, misconfiguration happening. So, so long as you use a consistent interface, there'll be no conflicts. Even for Kubernetes, we provide an integration with the interface they provide. So, so long as you use one consistent interface, there'll be no conflicts. But if you choose to use two separate interfaces, there's obviously a chance of uh, stepping on each other's toes. Do you use uh, tags the same way you use uh, labels in uh, Kubernetes? Correct. So Kubernetes has the notion of labels and annotations. And those labels and annotations, we translate them to contrail tags. And one of the slides in my deck, it showed the mapping of which Kubernetes annotations, which Kubernetes labels, that are part of the Kubernetes network policy um, specification, what contrail objects do those map to? Uh, you mentioned that uh, contrail is uh, now called uh, constant uh, fabric, is that right? I'm sorry, contrail is now called? Constant fabric. Yeah, so. Is contrail uh, uh, then replaced by that? Or so good question, let me uh, repeat that question. The question was, um, please explain Contrail and its relation to Tungsten Fabric. Now, Contrail is a suite, a portfolio of products that, that belong to Juniper Networks. This portfolio of products has always been based on an open source project since its inception in the year 2013, September 2013. The first release, the first generally available product from this portfolio of products, uh, it was generally available September 2013. Since that day, it has been open source. Now, in September 2013, the open source offering was called Open Contrail. Um, sometime last year, we decided to donate the Open Contrail project to the Linux Foundation. And when the Linux Foundation took on Open Contrail, they renamed this project from Open Contrail to Tungsten Fabric. So the Tungsten Fabric is the new trademark, is the new name for the open source project based on which Contrail, the portfolio, the suite of products is, um, is built by Juniper Networks. Built, sold, supported by Juniper Networks. More questions? Uh, yes. <coughs> You mentioned that the policy enforcement is done by, uh, uh, by uh, the smaller part of FDR. Uh, yes. I'm wondering uh, uh, if, if that's part of the open source products. 
It is. And do you have any performance paper to share uh, about that comparing with IP tables or M tables? Sure. So we have some performance uh, performance numbers we have published um, on our opencontrail.org slash blog. So there's a blog where we publish various aspects, various technical aspects of our product. And we have published some comparison numbers on that blog. More question? Yes. I'll repeat the question. The question is, can you apply these kinds of policies to a bare metal server? And it's a very valid, fair question. And the short answer is, yes, you can. So there are two ways in which you can do that. Bare metal server means the workloads are non-virtualized. Non-virtualized could mean two different things. One is they are non-virtualized but running on a Linux machine. Or they are non-virtualized, but they are also not running on a Linux or a derivative of Linux. So let's take the first example. In the first example, if the non-virtualized workload is running on a Linux box, you can still run the FER node. You can still run the FER node there on that box. And then everything, all the tag-based security that we discussed applies just natively on that Linux box for the non-virtualized workload. In the scenario where your workload is non-virtualized and running on an operating system that is not Linux, which means uh, the FER cannot natively run on that box, then the next, be next best place for enforcement of the security policies is the top of rack switch to which that bare metal server connects to. And so we are working on a framework that translates the, the tag-based policy, the tag-based security policy, to corresponding ACL or firewall filter based on the platform the top of rack switch runs um, so that you can get the consistent security notion if not at the bare metal server then at the top of rack switch on the port to which that top of rack switch is connected. So that's the long answer to the short question. Yeah, another question I have is uh, usually you have to attach the tag to some object. Yes. So the bare metal server, is there a way you can do this kind of thing? Yes, certainly. So again, there are a number of places where tags can be attached. Either you can attach them at the workload, or a group of workloads are members of a virtual network, or a, virtual ne or a number of virtual networks are part of what is called as a project that usually corresponds to a tenant. So you could attach tags to a bare metal server, or to the virtual network within which the bare metal server belongs, or to the project within which the bare metal server belongs. Which, by the way, indirectly, I also, um, um, I didn't explain, but what that also means is network virtualization extends to bare metal servers just the same as the, the, the security solution does. So bare metal servers can also be included inside virtual networks. I have another question. Because when you use open contrail, usually for this kind of policy, uh, I suppose people can use in custom tag instead of the predefined tag. Yes. But when you try to define the, the power rule, there's no way you can use this kind of custom tag at all. Is that a bug or limitation or? Mm. I'm, I'm not sure what do you mean. When you define a firewall policy, in, at the end point, you always write like a tier equal to web yeah. or tier equal to app. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that's a custom tag, for example, you say this is a, maybe vendor equal to Apple or vendor equal to Intel. Yeah. But when you try to associate this kind of thing with a security policy, you cannot do that at all in a GUI today. In the GUI. Now, the GUI, uh, look, the, the purpose of the GUI is not to serve as a mechanism to configure, uh, to perform these configuration actions at scale. The way to perform configuration actions at scale is to invoke APIs and to script these uh, API invocations inside your uh, automation frameworks. 
So via APIs, the ability to invoke and create custom tags is 100% is present. To make such things available in the API, in the, in the graphical user interface, would mean that you are making it available to a very large uh, cross-section of customers and have the potential of confusing the customers. And therefore, in that interest, we've kept the GUI relatively simple. All the power is definitely available via uh, API invocations. Really good questions, and thank you everyone for asking these questions. Happy to answer more questions if there are. If there are. Certainly. The question is, is there any reason to use OpenShift with Contrail? So yes, there are a number of reasons. The first is um, Contrail is very well suited for for empowering application developers to enhance the velocity with which applications are being deployed. Notions like Kubernetes and OpenShift that builds on top of Kubernetes are, are made for that very purpose, to empower application developers so that they can churn out <laughs> applications at a very rapid velocity, and for everything else, for all the infrastructure to move out of the way. And by way, of our uh, by way of our integration, not just with Kubernetes, but also specifically with OpenShift and implementing the different aspects of network segmentation, load balancing, and security, we, we are first class citizens of OpenShift. We have a first class partnership with Red Hat. And, and therefore, there's a lot of value for someone to use Contrail with OpenShift. Calico is, solves similar problems that Contrail does. So is there, is there any advantage of using both at the same time? Usually, using two solutions to solve the same problem, I'm, I'm giving a general answer. The question is, is there, is there any advantage to using uh, two solutions to networking slash security? And the specific example was Calico alongside uh, Contrail. That was the question. And the answer is usually using two separate solutions alongside each other to solve the same problem does not often have a very um, graceful result. Because now you are competing with the, the, the same um, interface. And let's say, let's take one example of the Kubernetes network policy because we've seen that example in the slides before. Calico provides an implementation for the Kubernetes network policy, so does Contrail. So what, I would actually turn the question to you, what benefit do you see in having two implementations for network policy to solve the same problem? You're returning the question. I, I, I don't see. The question is probably can be better asked by us. Uh, how do you, how do we compare Calico and uh, uh, Contrail? What so that is a good question that I can answer. That's that's a good question I can answer. Now there are a number of benefits to using um, uh, Contrail as opposed to Calico. One is we have a network virtualization, a intent-driven software-defined security analytics and monitoring, all integrated. It applies to a number of different orchestrators, the different form factors of workloads, on-prem and public clouds alike. At the same time, and this is the killer, at the same time, with the same set of primitives, you also have the ability to manage, orchestrate, and control your physical networking devices. That is something that Calico does not have any integration, any answer. So you have now a single pane of glass management for on-prem and public cloud, for your physical networking underlay, your network virtualization overlays across on-prem and public clouds. That is something that's very powerful that Calico doesn't have an answer to. Layer two, layer three switch, or does it go 
Sure. The question is, does Contrail work with any layer two, layer three switch? Um, or can I, can I uh, uh, talk to Juniper and they're listening to our switches and uh, their products work with? Sure. The, the follow on question is, or can he work with Juniper to get a list of the supported switches? The answer to that is this aspect of managing physical networking underlay is a complete presentation of its own. But in the interest of time, let me quickly answer this question in short. What we have done is our, our implementation that integrates and communicates with physical network devices is standards based. We speak um, open standards languages like OVSDB, NetConf, EVPN, VXLAN, et cetera. So any switching platforms that implement these technologies, we'll be able to communicate and uh, uh, work with. The controller exists. The controller that speaks these languages, OVSDB, EVPN, VXLAN, NetConf, the controller that speaks these languages exists and is built. Uh, that is the control controller. So I, I, I just switch into my uh, network. How does that um, switch? Correct. So this question is about how does um, a, a switch in, in his environment in a data center, for example, uh, establish some kind of communication with the controller and everything that follows. And again, the answer is we are getting into more and more details about the whole underlay management aspect of Contrail, which deserves in, an entire presentation of its own. But in a very short, concise uh, answer, let me explain this. There's, there's a process with which underlay devices are first discovered, assuming it's a brownfield environment, and there are physical networking underlay switches and other devices already deployed, then we have the ability to discover them. Once they are discovered, they are considered as managed or onboarded devices. And then once they are uh, discovered, then the controller establishes some kind of, uh, some kind of handshake mechanism and establishes some kind of um, uh, channel of communication with those devices and then incremental config associated with extending virtual networks or pushing uh, security ACLs or firewall filters, all of that is done once that, um, once that switch or device has been onboarded. And we have some uh, video recordings of some demos that are al already available on, um, on tungstenfabric.io or on the Juniper Networks channels. They're definitely very relevant and very good questions. So thank you everyone for asking all these questions. Thank you.